So today I'm going to talk about uh, how we use uh, React to store and uh, analyze uh, events uh, at a flow at booking.com. So um, as also said, I'm Damien Krotkin. I'm a senior software engineer at booking.com. Uh, I'm known as uh, Dams on GitHub and some other internet services. You can reach me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Feel free to give me feedback on these talks and other topics. So I do work at Booking.com. I guess nearly all of you know Booking.com. If you don't, please raise your hand. Okay, no hands. Oh, one hand. Okay, so we are number one um, website uh, on accommodation. <coughs> uh, so um, we are a very big website, basically. We have more than uh, 800,000 hotels, actually. These figures are not up to date in more than 200 countries. A lot of rooms are booked every day, like we are more than 800,000 rooms booked every single day, so that's quite a lot. Of course, we have millions of guest reviews, a lot of offices, and we are now reaching uh, 9,000 or 10,000 people, from which we have seven, more than 700 people uh, in working in IT, in a big office in Amsterdam, so uh, we have a very big IT team. So. Basically, it's not a small website. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with a very quick and rushed introduction about events, what they are, and how we use them for. So when, um, uh, when a user browses uh, our booking.com uh, website, of course, uh, there is interaction with uh, the booking platform. But uh, other clients are uh, smartphones, for instance, and also we have special clients which are hotels, basically. They use APIs and other uh, non-web means to connect to our platform to change uh, rooms, uh, availability, prices, and so on. So these are just only three out of many examples of uh, customers um, uh, reaching out and using our platforms. So on our platform we have, so this is a very simplified view of our front end, of course, but you can maybe represent it like that. Uh, web, mobile, and API uh, uh, front-end subparts, which, which is uh, replying to the users. And while they are doing so, of course, the front-end is using a bunch of stuff uh, in, in the back-end, templates, uh, databases, caches, uh, message queues, and so on. And while they are um, doing so, these back-end subsystems are sending events to our centralized event storage. Okay, so that should be pretty straightforward for definition of what an events flow is. Uh, of course, we have uh, events from web, mobile, API, databases, caches, load balancers, availability clusters, demons that do stuff with emails, of course, and a lot of other sub-part uh, sub of our platform. Basically, we try to have events from everything from our backend. Now, what's an event? An event is only a piece of data which provides information about our subsystems. So technically, uh, it is a deep hash map data structure, so key value data structure, which values can be anything, um, scatter, arrays, or yet again, um, uh, recursive uh, uh, key value uh, structure. And um, <clears throat> this uh, piece of data does not do anything operational. It just uh, provides information on, on the subsystems. All our events have to um, specify a timestamp, a type, and a subtype, and then the rest. And the rest is specific to the subsystem which uh, emitted the event. And we have so many different subsystems, and every developer can change what such subsystem sends as an event, that at the end, we cannot draw any schema of our event. So our event flow is schemaless, and this is very important for um, the, the specifics, the properties of our pi pipeline. <clears throat> so this is an example of uh, a big event. Uh, we have very big event, very small event, and events of any size. So basically here we can see uh, this, is a, this is a hash uh, structure with timestamp type equal web, subtype equal app. So this is a big event coming from the web, uh, the main web application. Uh, it has of course a data center, DC, a data center number, and this is specific to the web application um, uh, event type. 
So we cannot, dry, uh, uh, we cannot draw a schema out of this. But here we can see that uh, we have the list of requests, the time it took, and here we have um, warning messages, a, a bunch of very uh, interesting but very, very big stuff. Here, uh, <coughs> on the opposite side of the scale, we have a very small um, event, which comes from our availability cluster. An availability cluster is a group of uh, clusters actually that is responsible of knowing which, uh, how many rooms at what price is available uh, for a given time. So here we can see that there were seven queries with a latency of 21 milliseconds, I think, from this cluster. So this is a very small event. So now the property of our event flow is that events are of course read-only, we never change them. Technically we could, but we don't. Schemaless, we have more than 50k events per second which adds up to 4 billion uh, four billions events per day. Um, network usage is more than uh, 150 meg per second, actually. Uh, one year ago, we were storing 1.5 terabyte of events per day. In one year, we have switched to 6 terabyte, so it is a huge growth. Um, we store, so we want the storage uh, for the hot, uh, to be considered as the hot storage, which will uh, keep the last 10 days or eight to 10 days. And for the rest, we also send a copy to Hadoop for very slow but very long uh, queries. We use our events to do real-time graph. For instance, that's the first usage. Uh, we try to, uh, uh, to draw graphs of all our parts in our um, subsystems. So, yeah, we, we want a general platform health check that humans can actually uh, feel and see. So this is an example. I've removed the scales, of course, but this is an example of a graph. Here we can see the number of events and the number of events with warnings and errors. A very simple graph. Here we have another, another one where we can see the top 10 abnormal user type. Um, so here we can see that we have a type is strange users that do a lot of visits, but they never actually book any rooms. So these are probably competitors trying to see what kind of hotels and prices we are doing. Uh, all teams at Booking.com are uh, creating and managing uh, uh, a lot of graphs that then are gathered together into dashboards, and then we have dashboards of dashboards and stuff. And all this is created, uh, created by using the events flow. Uh, so we have a, a big uh, fetcher, group of fetchers that are consuming the, 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 the flow and using the values uh, into the, the events to create to create matrix and send it to Graphite. We have a very big Graphite installation. And because this system, which is fetching and, and graphing, is part of our backend, then we can graph it as well. So we have so-called metagraph. So it's kind of a bit crazy maybe. We're graphing too much, but at least we know what's happening. We also use events to do short-term analysis. Uh, from 10 seconds to a few hours. For instance, when we deploy something in production, we have a very quick way to roll back, and we have automated um, uh, processes that use the constant even flow to uh, detect any uh, issues, any breakage, so that we can roll back very easily. Uh, on average, we do a production code deployment uh, 100 times per day. So. Uh, apart from that, we also have an anomaly detector which is consuming uh, a window of events, last two minutes for instance, and applies algorithm to detect strange behavior, like if we are under a DDoS or hackers attack, uh, we use that to, uh, to uh, detect these. So anomaly detector, detector is a very important piece of our uh, security and, uh, and uh, backend, and basically the event flow is very <clears throat> Sorry, very important to us. So it has to be there. Also, we are a data-driven company, so we do A-B testing. You probably know what this is. So every developer can create an experiment where it will change the color of a button on the front end, for instance, and then uh, it will, and then the result, if this button is making more booking or less booking, is uh, coming back into the event flow, back to us, so we can decide if it's a good feature or not. So let's take a very brief look at the overview. So here we have front end plus back end plus everything, which is sending. Uh, so these are called the producers, producers of events. They are sending events as UDP to a first layer of boxes, which are the listeners. 
So you can see that we are sending, of course, we are sending uh, events over the wire on the network. So the data structure that I've shown you uh, in memory needs to be serialized at some point before we can send it uh, via UDP. If you have a question on why we use UDP, you can uh, talk to me after the conference, after the talk, I will explain you why. Then we have a second layer, which are called relocators, that actually take the events from these boxes and send them to our global storage. This way of doing is very classical, it's a bit of historical, and could at some point be changed to a more queue-oriented system. But it was there, so we used that. Now we need to aggregate uh, our events. So basically, we don't want to send our events individually because it's kind of a waste of a resource. It's not a big deal for a fetcher to fetch one second of event and then find the events it actually needs inside uh, that blob. So the granularity is the second, and we want to group our events as soon as possible. So to be able to do that, we need to serialize our events over the network. Um, long time ago, we tried JSON, but for a few minutes only, because JSON didn't work for us at all. Uh, it's very slow to encode and decode, and um, it produces big results. That is, so basically, the, the, the only good feature of JSON is that it's human readable. But it lacks a lot of features, like being able to uh, have binary um, uh, data inside uh, the structure, being able to refer to a, a previous um, reference of sub data structure. So, for instance, it's not really possible to, do a, to have a recursive data structure in JSON. So we created Serial in 2012, which is a new binary data uh, serialization format that provides high performance schema-less serialization. So this is the key. It's a new serialization format because uh, we didn't find any that would suit our schema-less um, type of data structure. Otherwise, we could have used things like uh, protocol buffers or other formats that already existed. You can check it out on GitHub. It's a very nice piece of software, very efficient. Let's go back to our logger. We have a bunch of events that are streaming, uh, so sent uh, via UDP on our logger first layer of machines. The colors are the different types. Uh, the loggers are responsible for doing the first aggregation by simply accumulating events in different silos, different stacks per type. So nothing very complicated. After one second, we take a slice of the events and we, we take the group of events per type uh, for this epoch, this second, and we resolize and recompress them to have the smallest uh, size possible, and we send it to the storage. Of course, we have many uh, boxes doing that. Now, back to the storage. What kind of storage did we use? Uh, we wanted um, storage security. So it's, it's, it's the number one feature because uh, so many critical things rely on the, our event flow. We uh, needed storage security. We also need a massive write performance. Uh, because we want to be able to take to intake uh, the events flow in real time. And especially when the website is in a strange situation, when all our, our platform is under a DDoS attack, for instance, or with something weird happening, the, the, the events flow goes crazy. It, it can double. Uh, but this is exactly at that point that everybody in the company wants to look at what's going on. So they want to fetch uh, like uh, two times or three times more than usually. Uh, our events. So we need a, a very good write performance and also uh, actually a bigger read performance. Um, on top of that, we required easy administration because the team um, setting this up and managing, managing it was very small. And we need to scale because every, every year or every two years we double everything at booking. That's natural growth and events are actually at a higher growth. So we reviewed a bunch of contenders and we chose React because um, because it is very robust. I mean, uh, it's the, probably the, the best ring clustered solution uh, in terms of robustness. And it has a good and pre predictable read and write performance, as we will see. And it was the easiest to set up and administrate, so we went for it. Apart from that, which are enough to, um, to make our decision, it also has uh, advanced features, MapReduce, triggers, secondary indexes, CRDTs. We didn't use uh, all of them. But uh, yeah, it was like a future-proof um, uh, product. So this is React. Maybe you know about it uh, very briefly. It's a, a clustered uh, storage system uh, built on community hardware. 
where all nodes serve data. So basically, um, as an external user, you pick up, uh, you pick one random node, and you do a request against React, and React will take care of uh, doing replication of the data for you, uh, handling uh, network partitions, uh, when a nose goes down, when it go comes back, uh, uh, managing hidden handoffs, and so on. So it's very easy to use and to administrate, um, and it uses a gossip protocol between nodes. Uh, yeah, so it's a distributed system. It's written in Erlang. <coughs> when um, React, when, when um, we want to store something in React, uh, we send a key and a value to a random node, and React is uh, applying a hash function on the key, so on the name of the value, and from that, it uh, deduces uh, primary nodes, in this case three, because by default the uh, replication, replica number is three, but you can change that, and it sends the data to these primary nodes. When you fetch data, it does, uh, does it the opposite way. So very simple stuff. It's not using um, consistent hashing, it's based on uh, simple hashing. So React is a key value store. Uh, keys are unique in a given namespace. Namespaces are called buckets. Values can be either opaque, so React doesn't uh, want to know really what's in a <coughs> value. It can be text, JSON, binary, whatever. Or it can be certities, which are really great, but we didn't use it for this project. I used it in another project. So here we have simple keys and simple uh, binary values. Um, React is very flexible, and you can choose uh, how to store data on disk or in memory. Uh, it provides at least three uh, main backend, Bitcask, LevelDB, and a memory backend, which is based on Erlang ETS um, data structure. And we, cho we, we decided to go with uh, the Bitcask backend because it's a simple backend, which is easy to understand, and it provides predictable performance. So basically, it uses append-only files, which are open, and everything is appended to, uh, to these files. Even when you want to change a value or to delete a value, uh, it happens the command to execute at the end of files. And after a while, uh, these files are closed, compacted, and data is expired while doing compaction. And that's it, we move to new files. Um, <clears throat> the keys are loaded in memory, which is not the case with LevelDB. But here, we don't actually have that many keys because we are aggregating our event. So um, the keys have to fit in memory, which provides you a good predictability uh, when you want to fetch data. Fetching data from Bitcask means to uh, find the key in memory and then fetch the data from the disk. But Bitcask uses the file system cache, so the data is probably already in memory. And if not, you're guaranteed to reach your data with one disk seek maximum, which is not the case with LevelDB. Also, LevelDB has other good points. So this backend is perfect for sequential data, and this is why we used, we used it for our event storage. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly uh, through these slides. So these are the numbers that we uh, needed when we started. So we needed to store 60 terabytes of data. Uh, basically because 100 uh, gig per hour replication factor three and so on. Um, we went with two clusters, each of them with 12 nodes at the start. Now we are at more than 32 nodes per cluster with uh, 12 CPUs, a hell lot of memory, which is great. Eight terabyte, it's okay. It's okay. And only one gigabit uh, network speed, which is an issue. And we are trying to see if I have time how uh, we worked around this issue. So we would have been much more comfortable on a 10, 10G network, and we are getting there, but when we started until now, we had to cope with 1G network. So you remember uh, saving uh, this event flow to the storage, which is going to be React. Now we have to think about the data design. <coughs> so here, when we are, we are at the end of the relocator layer, we are storing uh, the, this group of events, which represent one second of events, into a React. Uh, so we have a blob of events, and we have, uh, so one blob is per epoch, so the number of seconds, timestamp, then the data center number, uh, the type, and the subtype. There's also a cell um, uh, type, but this is just for implementation, uh, so uh, nothing very fancy there. And so we group our events by these uh, combination of characteristics. 
that gives us a binary blob. If this blob is bigger than 500k, we chunk it again so that we have values that are small-ish to store into React because you don't want to store big values in React. So um, we are going to store these blobs into the bucket name called data because why not? And the key is going to be just the concatenation of all the properties using uh, whatever separator you want. Okay, so this is very simple. The value is, of course, the blob, the list of events for these characteristics, serialized and compressed. That gives us 200 or more keys per second, but not 10,000, which is great because then we have a reduced number of keys. However, in React, if you don't want to use additional indexes or solar or secondary indexes, you need to know exactly the name of the key to be able to fetch events. And a consumer fetcher is, uh, is not going to know all these properties to fetch the data. So what we do is after we have saved the, the data, the important bits, we create another key, a metadata key, which is going to be in the metadata namespace. And the key here is going to be much simpler. Only timestamp, because all consumer knows about uh, the time they want the events from, and the data center, which also is something known. And the value of this key is going to be the list of long data keys. So here we can see that when we store data, we, we are going, for instance, to store these three keys, so three blobs for this epoch and data center. So we start by writing these. And once they are written, then we, we, we write the metadata here. And you can see the key is very simple, easy to understand, and the value points to uh, data keys. Okay? So it's going to be a two-layer uh, uh, data architecture. Um, Writing data, so um, yeah, that's what we do. So we push the data, then the metadata. That means that here we can we can have uh, some sense of atomicity. Basically, if a metadata key is in React, then you can be pretty sure that the data keys are there. It's not guaranteed because um, it's um, uh, eventual consistency, but still. Um, so we do that in Perl, this is only pseudocode, but it's very easy. You instantiate a React client, you put the data here. So this is the namespace name, and this is the values, this is the key names, and after that, you do the same with the metadata. So nothing very complex here. Um, the push strategy is to use many uh, boxes from the relocator layer to um, do parallelization using many machines to, to be able to, uh, to um, send uh, using all the nodes of the clusters, and we want to maximize IO usage, um, uh, basically network usage. So to do so, I've written uh, a new Perl client uh, using any event, which is a very efficient uh, event-oriented library. Uh, so a new client to React, and by using that, we are able to maximize the performance of our network. When we want to read data, well, it's very easy. Um, we decide which epoch, which uh, timestamp, and which data center we want, to we want to read from. And we read the metadata for the given epoch and DC. That gives us this value. And then we fetch them in parallel from the data namespace. Why doing so? If the fetcher is only interested in EMK uh, type, for instance, then, of course, it doesn't need to fetch the web key. So there is a first... Uh, way of filtering out unwanted uh, event types. So again, yeah, when we fetch data, we read from the metadata, and then following the links, we read from the data namespace. In Perl, again, uh, that would be here, I have my React client. I use it to get the timestamp and DC from the metadata namespace, which returns me a list, which I, uh, sorry, um, uh, clear text, the, the metadata, which I split on pipe. That gives me an array. While I'm at it, I uh, grab only the type I'm interested into from that array, which gives me a filter array on which I loop, and I use the client to get the data keys from the data namespace. All right. So here we have managed to fetch one second worth of events. Great, but if I want the last 10 minutes, then uh, we do a very stupid things for which React is kind of optimized for. We simply enumerate all the seconds from zero to minus 10 minutes, and we do massive parallel fetch from React to get all our data. And React actually excels at handling huge number of requests per second, so this is the recommended way of using React. 
uh, it's no use to try to do a bulk fetch or use MapReduce to get things out of React. Parallel fetching is the way to go. So I set up these first 12 nodes cluster with um, all our fetchers and using the data to do graphs, anomaly detection, and so on, and uh, the constant even stream going in. And basically, these boxes were doing nothing, like using one up to two uh, CPU uh, at the time. And uh, the uh, disk uh, uh, operation were kind of low because in terms of uh, disk IO utilization, we are very low, like it was very hard to see actually the disk usage. So it worked basically very well. And here we can see that the free space is reclaimed I have set up the expiration of the backend to be one day when I started. So we can see that we are cramming, uh, we are uh, pushing events into files, and then at the end of the day, up, we are doing massive expiration. So I've combined the compaction of the files, because React wants to compact files, to be done only after the data inside the files are expired. And there is a shortcut into uh, the Bitcask backend so that if the last data written is actually um, um, older than the expiration, it's not going to try to compact the file. It knows that all the data is too old, so it simply deletes the files. So it doesn't use any CPU to do that. So real-time processing outside of React, this is the normal way of using uh, our events flow at booking.com, basically. Um, we fetch, as I explained, we fetch either the last 10 seconds or the last minute or the last hour out of React by enumerating all the epochs and fetching them in parallel. And we do streaming. Uh, so um, we basically we can categorize the, the usage of the data into very short term, very real time oriented uh, fetching and up to batch oriented fetching. So we have streaming of data to send to Graphite every second. Uh, so we have a bunch of clusters fetching uh, all the data and, and crunching the data to send to Graphite. We have also the anomaly de detector, which is um, gathering data in real time, but creating a moving window of, say, two minutes to apply this, uh, his, its algorithm. We also have our A-B testing, which is kind of streaming the data. And then we send stuff to Hadoop every minute, or actually every hour, I don't remember. And um, so we are moving away from real time. Then we have manual requests done by people trying to find issues, and uh, batch, batch fetches, and so on. So basically, we have all kinds of different uh, strategy in fetching. So we cannot really optimize our storage for these or these others. And that um, ends up being a huge numbers of read requests. So this is a way to look at it. And you can see that these, all these, um, all these uh, uh, systems and clusters are fetching from the event storage, and they may be actually fetching the same data at the same time because they need it. So it adds up in terms of bandwidth usage, which is starting to be an issue because we are on a limited uh, network bandwidth of one gig. However, it's real time because so with few seconds lag, uh, you can, an event is stored in less than one second, and it's available. Uh, just um, before um, before a few seconds. So the issue again is network saturation. Instead of doing uh, real-time processing outside of React, uh, we are actually doing some of our processing inside of React to try to limit the network usage. So we are not doing everything inside React, but more and more we're trying to push to do that inside React. What does that mean? It means that the idea is that instead of fetching data, we take a lot of network bandwidth, then crunch the data to produce a very small number, for instance. Everything we send to Graphite are very small numbers, like averages and stuff like that, number of warnings and so on. And then that produces a very small result. Instead of doing that, let's bring the code to the data, near the data, try to use data locality to crunch the data by the CPUs on the React nodes, and then the result is very small, and then we can fetch this result, which is going to be very few bytes, and drastically reduce the network usage. So when you say bring the code to data, um, usually we need to uh, actually look at what it means. Um, 
what takes time is fetching the data out. So we, we, we saw that this, this is pretty clear. But also decompressing the data is taking a lot of time. Because we are using uh, heavily serialized and compressed data, it takes four seconds, for instance, to decompress one second worth of data. So you want to prioritize stuff, and you want to be careful of the CPU time you use to decompress data. So when you say bring the code to the data, uh, the idea that immediately comes to mind is uh, use MapReduce. So React provides uh, uh, quite a nice MapReduce uh, feature. So I played with it, and I, um, I managed to set up a MapReduce um, uh, jobs, and it was working fine. And actually, achieved I achieved to have uh, real-time MapReduce. I was able to create and run a MapReduce job job on one second worth of data, which would execute in less than one second. So this is real-time MapReduce. Um, quite different from Hadoop MapReduce, for instance. Um, however, the issue is that so the good thing is that network usage is reduced to uh, almost zero because the data is crunched on the nodes. However, um, if you have 50 people trying to fetch, uh, to crunch data on the same uh, epoch, on the same timestamp, they are going to fire 50 different MapReduce jobs. And because MapReduce jobs are isolated, um, because that's the design of the feature, they are all going to decompress uh, the data in memory 50 times. And so we are actually overusing our CPU, and it means that it's effectively useless for more than five to 10 map producers. Otherwise, you need a huge cluster. So this was not the way to go. So I looked at another feature of React, which, has, which are hooks. Uh, we have pre-commit and post-commit hook, which basically allows you to write code and put that in a callback on the React um, infrastructure and have that callback uh, triggered and execu executed when data is about to be stored or has just been stored. I use the latter, so post commit hook executes code from you just when the data has been stored. And I use that uh, to crunch the data on the node. So this is how it goes. React uh, sends the, so this is the relocator box, basically sending the data to React here by choosing a random node. React stores the data to the replicas and then here we have the node hardware on which the React service is running. React is triggering the post commit hook, which executes uh, my code. And my code receives actually the key of, uh, of the data that has been stored. So this is the metadata key. And it sends the key to a companion REST service, which is on the same node, but which is completely different from React. This is some very stupid REST service uh, that we have implemented, which receives the key and fetches the key, the, the data from React, and then applies all our data processing, uh, data processes on the data which is decompressed in memory, which means that the data is fetched once, decompressed only once in memory, and all our data crunching jobs are executed on that particular bit. And uh, that that means that the data is decompressed only once. And so all these jobs produce a set of very small results that we can send back to the client or actually send back to React because these are very small values. So this is the code of the hook code. I'm going to go very quickly over it. Basically, um, the API of the hook, the post commit hook, is that we receive the React object from which we extract the key and the bucket. So this is the metadata um, uh, key and value. So from the, from the key name, uh, we can extract the epoch and the data center. And from the value, uh, if we split on pipe, we get a list of data keys. Okay? And we send all of this to our REST API by calling the send to REST function. So here we are talking of maybe 100 bytes, very small data. Send to REST is basically building a um, URL to a uh, host name. So, um, and it, uh, the body is the data keys that we encode in JSON, in JSON because we don't care about performance here. The value is so small. And we send it as an HTTP request with this option, sync equal false, meaning fire and forget. So we have effectively decoupled 
the React service and this data crunching uh, service so that we cannot bring down React if, um, if we cannot reach the service or if uh, there is some data processes that uh, goes wrong. So this is very important for us to decouple them. On the other side, we have a REST service written in Perl using PSGI, which is a Perl implementation of WSGI, well known for Python devs. Uh, so the web server is Starman using Prefox. I'm not going to show you the code because it's very simple. Basically, we receive the key, we instantiate, or we use a React uh, client, we fetch the, 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 the values, we decompress them in, in memory, and then we receive a list of data jobs to uh, execute on this. We do that, and then at the end, we send the results back to React. It's scalable because the more nodes you have, the more CPU space you have, the more memory you have. So if it's too slow, just add nodes. And there is a nice trick. Instead of having the post commit hook calling the companion on the same node, because then the companion is going to fetch the data from uh, the primary keys, the primary nodes from this key, but um, there is a big chance that the data is not on this node. So it will have to fetch from all the nodes inside the network and then store the result. Instead of doing that, we change the arrows so that the React uh, post commit hook, because it knows everything about the ring, can send the key to actually one of the primary nodes for that key. And then uh, the companion is going to ask React for the value, but it turns out that the value is on the same node. So here we have 100% data locality and the value never cross the never goes on the wires um, inside the cluster and outside of the cluster we are only fetching the very small values a lot of advantages that i've listed so data locality that i do compress only once and so on also it can be written in any language which is great we use perl but you can have your uh, rest service in java or in python or whatever these advantages it only works for streaming data for incoming data. You can say, oh, I have a new data job I need to execute to the past two months of events. That's not going to work. It's by design. We needed a streaming um, data crunching uh, solution. And you cannot easily do cross-second data because the values are spread over all the nodes. So it's not something I've really uh, worked into. We don't need that, but uh, it's not very trivial to do. Let's go back to the bandwidth problem because here it works fine if we do data crunching on the um, cluster, but this is kind of new and we are doing some data crunching that way, but uh, a big uh, chunk, the majority of uh, data crunching happens by fetching the data out of, outside of React as I've uh, displayed. So we cannot migrate everything to be done on the cluster, so let's try to optimize the way data is uh, fetched out uh, of uh, React. So this is called the bandwidth problem. Um, let's have a look. When we fetch data from React into the, by using the standard way, we issue, okay, we pick up one random node here and we say, please give me that key. React is going to issue uh, the request to uh, the primary nodes. And because that's the way we've configured it, because we have read-only data, when the first request reach this node, then we returns it to the client. So by default, React is optimized for speed. Okay, request all the primary nodes as soon as one of them reach, uh, which has returned it. This is because you configure it that, that way. You could configure it using quorum or to make sure there's no conflict or so on. But here we have um, read-only uh, data which have internal checksum. So we can check for conflicts and uh, data corruption. That was if you are in the bad case. If you are in the good case, uh, by Rendering, uh, randomly choosing a node, it happens that uh, you reach out a primary node, in which case React is only uh, going to issue a request on the two other primary nodes. So in this case, we are only using two times the outside network usage. But basically, we can say that roughly on average, the inside network usage in your cluster is three times the outside network usage because of these primary uh, nodes and this replication. Um, usually it's not a problem, but in our case it is because we are limited uh, on one G network and we have so many people willing to fetch out of React that they are saturating the network outside of the cluster. 
two solutions for that. One of them is to optimize the query for um, network usage instead of, uh, of um, speed. There is a little known uh, parameter that you can uh, set when fetching from React is nval equal one, which means that it says to React, please, when you do this request, consider that I have only one replica and not the default three. By doing so, React is going to fetch the data only from one primary key. And if you are lucky and if you actually fetched, uh, uh, poked at a primary key, then the data is actually not using any of the internal uh, network usage. And that works only because the data is read-only, of course. There is no conflict, and uh, we have checksum to detect corruptions. By doing so, the practical network usage was divided by two, which is a huge gain. The other solution is to uh, stop choosing a node randomly but try to always fetch from a primary node. So when we store or fetch something in React, we pick up a random node by default. React is taking the bucket name and the key name and applies a hash function. That gives a result, a big num, and using the ring status, it can know where the primary key is, okay? The, and, and, and so it can store or fetch from the primary nodes. The idea is to do these processing on the client and before we speak to React so that we can have the knowledge of the ring status and do the, apply the hash function on it and directly know which primary keys are there so we can reach them and be in the good case of the previous slides. How do we do? Well, by default, if you look at the default configuration of React, you can see that the default hash function is C hash STD key fun, which is found, found in this module, React Core Util. React is open source, so I went to GitHub and looked at the source code. I found the occurrence in this file. And here, this is uh, the function uh, which is called, and we can see that it calls SHA, which is actually a SHA-1 implementation. So very simple, React uses SHA-1, we, we know how to, that, uh, to do that on the client side. So that's one part of the stuff done. The other part is to know about the ring status. So this is a bit more uh, complex, but basically I created an Erlang app, which is loaded uh, when React starts, and which hooks itself into web machine, which is the HTTP API of React, to add a new endpoint of the API. And when we query it, it returns the ring status. Because the, so the cluster status. Because the cluster architecture, the cluster topology doesn't change that more that often. I mean, we don't add a new node every minute. We can cache this result for, let's say, 10 minutes or one hour. And so we are not obliged to query React all the time to get the ring status. And we can do the hash uh, function on the client. So this is uh, the result of this new endpoint I have added to uh, React. And it returns a list of big num, which are actually the result uh, of the hash functions, intervals, and uh, mapped to uh, React nodes. So when I apply my hash function, so SHA-1, on the serialized uh, concatenation of key and bucket string, I get a number. So usually a very big number, but for this example, I've taken this one. We can see that it is between zero and this huge number. So this means that the primary node is 16. And because replication is three, then we simply uh, React takes the next two uh, nodes as the next uh, primary nodes. So by combining these two features, ring status plus applying SHA-1 on the client, then we can know exactly what the primary node for this key is, and we can uh, poke React directly to the primary node. So we are never in the bad case, and uh, we can reduce the network usage um, even more. A uh, word of warning, this is possible only if your nodes are properly monitored. We already had Zookeeper there, so uh, we use that. Because when a node is down, you don't want to spam it uh, with a lot of requests and then uh, fall back to uh, um, uh, picking up a random node. And also you have to make sure that the data is requested in a uniform way. 
Otherwise, if everybody is always interested into the same data for the same epoch, and if you don't have enough keys, if your data is not spread uh, enough on all your key namespace, then you are going to create a hotspot on three nodes for one second, mm -hmm. then three next nodes for one uh, second. This is something you want to avoid. As a result, network usage even more reduced comes to the conclusion of this talk, uh, we used only the React open source version. We used the, all the information uh, that is available on, uh, in the community. We didn't buy any training, even though Basho would have loved us to do so. Uh, but yeah, we were a very small team of self-taught engineer, and uh, React was a great solution for us. It's robust, it's very robust. I mean, if you have to remember one thing about this talk is that React is very robust fast, predictable, and scalable. And in addition to that, it is very flexible and hackable, as I have, uh, I hope, demonstrated to you. And it helped us to continue scaling. And um, we are probably going to continue using that for some years. Thank you very much. <laughs>